Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. Thanks for joining us today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team. I'm Fred Hall, Northwest Iowa Dairy Field Specialist. I'm here with Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Specialist, as we talk to our guest, Dr. Mike Hutchins. Great to be back on again, Fred. And I'll go ahead and introduce our presenter here today, Dr. Mike Hutchins. Dr. Mike Hutchins was raised on a grade Holstein farm near Green Bay, Wisconsin. His bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees were awarded from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. From 1971 to 1979, Dr. Hutchins was extension dairy specialist at the University of Minnesota, where he coached the national champion team in 1978 at the World Dairy Expo. Since 1979, he has been a member of the University of Illinois Animal Sciences Department as Extension Dairy Specialist. He speaks at 60 to 70 meetings at at conferences in 46 states, 17 foreign countries, and nine Canadian provinces. Mike writes feed columns for Hordes Dairymen and Dairy Today and hosts the Dairy Monthly Hordes webinars. Mike, we were delighted to have you on our most recent webinar last week and wanted to provide another opportunity to share that information. So welcome to our podcast. Well, thank you very much, Fred, for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to participate in uh, the uh, podcast here today, and hopefully the information will be assist dairy producers to remain uh, profitable here in some challenging times as we uh, go through the, the COVID situation. Today, we bring another interesting topic gearing up for six and a half pounds of milk solids per hundred weight. If we look at most of the U.S. milk markets, farmers are paid for pounds of milk fat and milk protein. We know that milk protein is linked to cheese and yogurt production and much of what producers are buying right now. Farmers have been and continue to make changes on the farm to reflect higher components, making feeding and rumen management a critical piece on the farm. Mike, what really has us thinking about gearing up for solids again? Well, certainly, Fred, with the nice introduction you've laid out there, uh, we look at the August price listings, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, we look at price per pound of protein farmers are paid $4.44 per pound, where milk fat is $1.63. It's pretty amazing because uh, just about a year ago, milk fat was uh, more expen- more valuable than milk protein. So these numbers will jump around a little bit, depending what the market is really demanding and needing. By the way, that uh, class three milk price would be right around $20 with those solid prices there. Pretty amazing when we look back in March, that's in, right in the, the throes of COVID. And there we were looking at $12 milk and protein at 209 and uh, milk fat at 138 So certainly we see now that protein especially has some real value to build the milk check. Yeah, Mike, those prices, you know, seem pretty variable this year. And you're right, capturing the high end of those components, you know, seem like another way that we can capture a few more cents on the dollar on the farm. But um, we also know that, you know, with that maybe comes an expense when we're trying to feed for that higher protein and fats. And there's many things that can come into play there with our diet to try to increase those components. And sometimes it comes down to, you know, economics. So, and also there's, you know, naturally some breeds that lend themselves to those higher components to begin with. And Ford's recently published the milk fat and milk protein for each breed, along with those average milk productions. So what are we seeing out there? Well, Jen, it's really interesting that there, as you point out, there are some real differences. And I will just highlight, rather than giving all the specific answers, but for Ayrshire's, if you look at that Hortz Dairman review there, uh, about uh, 4.5 pounds of fat and protein for Ayrshire, that's with 20,000 pounds of milk. Brown Swiss at 23,000 pounds of milk, 5.51 pounds of fat and protein. Guernsey's 4.46 with 17.5 milk. Jersey's at 20,000 pounds of milk, 5.61. Holstein's uh, come out with the highest number, 6 0.28 pounds with 27,000 pounds of milk. For our listeners, just so you're clear on that, we are looking at uh, the DHIR data published by Hortz Dairyman, um, 305 day 2x ME equivalent. So it gives you a little idea where these numbers are coming from. And then, of course, milking shorthorns at about 19,000 pounds of milk with 
12.27 pounds. So there's lots of differences there as well. And of course, another wild card in this gen would be the crossbreeds. And of course, uh, generally, they, they are somewhat intermediate in terms of components and milk yield, um, depending on whatever two breeds or three breeds you're going to be using. Yeah, so Mike, when we you know visit with producers, do you think our herds can re- realistically achieve that six and a half pounds of solids? And, you know, what might that look like for an 80 to a pound, 80 to 100 pound Holstein herd or maybe a 65 to 80 pound Jersey herd? Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. If we if we look at first Holstein, yeah, remember we said the, the average was a 6.28 pounds. That's a 90 pound tag average. Yes, yeah, that's pretty aggressive, but still that gives you a little bit of a feel with those components. And we'll talk about a little bit later here on the podcast. Uh, a herd with 80 pounds of milk Holstein using those same fat levels and protein levels, 5.58. Pounds and the top herds that are 100 pounds of milk, and yes, we have a number of those now here in the United States. Uh, 6.98 pounds, so certainly doable. In fact, uh, our top herd in Illinois last year, 102 pounds of milk average with a 4% fat, 3-2 protein, and your listeners can do the math very quickly there. They're well in excess of 7 pounds. Our jerseys, uh, we go back to the Horns Dairyman one, uh, that was a 65-pound milk average. They were producing 5.56 pounds of solids. If you take it up to 80 pounds of milk per jersey, that gets you up over at uh, 6.84. So certainly, we, we can reach those goals now. A number of herds are there now, and certainly that's what we have to look toward the future as we start seeing the competitiveness here in the dairy industry. Mike, walk us through evaluating milk fat. What is the research telling us about feeding fat, and what are the economics of doing so? Uh, well, Fred, basically, we are going to be looking at uh, two major sources of milk fat to the mammary gland that synthesizes the milk fat. One is going to be coming uh, from uh, basically the rumen volatile fatty acids uh, uh, in, in the rumen or bacteria. And the second one is going to be basically dietary fat and mobilized fat as far as that goes. Our question about adding fat to the ration, uh, we look at some older research from Pennsylvania. And, and basically, you're always going to see a, a nice uptick in butter fat. Uh, and when you're feeding fats. And they looked at tallow, cottonseed, and various soybean products here. Now, processing the soybean becomes important because it can have some uh, other effects, not only on fat, but on milk yield as well. So certainly those are, so adding fat certainly can be an alternative. And generally speaking, we are looking at three sources. The first one is going to be oil seeds, usually the most economical. The next one is going to be animal fat, usually applied at the processing plant. And the third one is buying a commercial dry granulated type product. Let's look at the economics of that one. Uh, Michigan State indicates that about 20% of the inert fat, and usually this is some type of a commercial palm oil, uh, steric acid type product, if that's costing us $1,040 per ton, and is a being for at 52 cents a pound. So let's do the simple math. If we take the Michigan State guideline, that means I'm going to put 52 cents in, and with today's modestly low butterfat test uh, value, rather, I'm going to get 33 cents back. So I think our producer has to really sharpen the pencil if they're going to be using some of those more expensive fat products. Now remember, we look strictly at milk fat. Uh, maybe we get more milk, maybe we get improved reproduction, maybe we improve improvement in animal health and less ketosis. So those all have some economic values as well. So right now, I think we have to be looking at pretty seriously, Fred, if we're adding fat at, at the oil seeds. And that could be the fuzzy cotton seed and some of the, the soy pro- products out there as well. And similarly, what about evaluating milk protein? Well, milk protein, of course, is the is is the, the real goal now at four dollars and forty four cents a pound. And so, our I basically have to ask ourselves, well, where does the mammary gland get the amino acids to make the milk protein? And the two major sources are going to be microbial bacteria; those are uh, those are, pr- are produced in the rumen, and the other one is going to be coming from rumen undegraded protein. And so, uh, that would be such things as heat treated soy products, uh, blood meal corn and distillers grains products like that so that is where the the protein is going to be coming in the milk uh, that you are marketing now at a very enhanced price here so anything we can do to enhance uh, the bacterial production of amino acids and then supplement that with purchased uh, products using a rumen model that should help us in terms of being a fairly economical response here in today's marketplace we do see herds often run into issues of low milk protein what might be some causes to that is it the feeding of protein not enough energy or or what else might be going on that we should factor in 
Well, Fred, you've done a very good job. You hit kind of the highlights right there. We break it down into three categories if your milk protein is low. And we'll tell you how you can look at your records here in just a minute to determine if you're really missing milk protein. Uh, The first one is going to be, as you point out, protein considerations. And and remember, when we look at that, that could be a a lack of getting enough uh, uh, raw product in the rumen, basically rumen degradable protein for the bacteria, or basically uh, a ration low in rumen undegraded protein, or the wrong rumen undegraded protein. For example, corn distillers grains is going to be quite low in lysine, and that, of course, is one of the first limiting amino acids. The second criteria would be energy. And you're saying, now, wait a minute, how does energy tie into milk protein? The answer is, well, we've got to grow amino acids in the rumen. So if we underfeed uh, carbohydrates, especially sugars and starches, uh, then we are now missing one of those building blocks of the rumen microbes as well. Second of all, if you overfeed uh, too much starch uh, in, in the diet, you can have uh, SERA, subacute rumen acidosis, and that's going to affect uh, the output of the rumen the bacteria itself. And you can feed the wrong kinds of fat. If you feed too much polyunsaturated fats, as we call PUFAs, then that literally inhibits some of the bacterial and that uh, bacterial activity, and that reduces the, the yield also. And of course, finally, Fred, the third one is what we call the non-nutrient factors. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, if you've got spoiled feeds or feeds that may have microtoxins, molds, and elevated yeast counts, that is going to have some negative effects in the rumen and perhaps dry matter intake and then just feed bump management, uh, frequency of feeding, pushing up feeds, just making sure that cows are encouraged to eat as much dry matter as we can. You know, Mike, in your extension career, you're probably a lot of different questions going on in the feeding nutrition world. So, you know, many of those questions may go back to, should I be feeding amino acids and how do I balance that? So is it is it cost effective to add methionine into the diet? Well, Jen, it's interesting because there is a lot of interest right now with this high milk protein price. Everybody wants to generate as many dollars as we can. Uh, Dr. Jimmy Clark, who uh, is retired from the University of Illinois, says if you're going to add amino acids uh, to the diets, one of three things could happen. One, we could see an increase in milk protein test. That would be good news. Uh, and that happens very quickly because we're very quickly getting amino acids into these animals. We might also see an increase in milk yield. And of course, if we get more milk yield, that also ends up more pounds of protein coming from the cow. And typically, and that is going to be somewhere uh, in early lactation, and that increase can vary from basically zero to five pounds. And then with methionine, we might see an increase in milk fat test. So we might see a fat test increase along with the milk protein. Now, Jen, let's go back and talk about methionine and say, well, is there is there a bang for your buck there? And if we look at some recent research and checking one of the major distributors, if I have an 80 pound of milk tank average if I can eat increased milk protein by a tenth of a point. And some researchers would say you can even get a little bit higher than that, but we'll keep it somewhat conservative today at a tenth of a pound. That means I'm going to get hundredths of a pound more protein. And while that doesn't sound like a big number, remember, protein at $4.44 a pound, that means I'm going to get $0.35 cents more income with a one-tenth point increase in milk protein with even maybe more upside as well. Absorbable uh, methionine costs about two cents per gram. Very common farmers are adding nutritionists, consultants, uh, 10 or 12 grams uh, to the cow's diet. So that means if we go with with the uh, uh, 10 grams, that's 20 cents. So the net profit there is 15 cents with a tenth of a point increase. And of course, it'd even be uh, uh, twice that if we get a, a higher response there. So the economics right now with today's protein prices are quite quite favorable at at this stage of the game. Now, to know how much methionine to feed, then the dairy farmer has to have someone who has what we call a rumen model. And a rumen model will predict amino acid yield coming from both the rumen microbial sources and from the undegraded protein sources coming into the feeding program. Having the producers kind of evaluate that, you know, producers and the nutritionists look at or DHI records. So how do you look at milk components when you're trying to balance the milk components and the overall health of the cow? Well, basically, Jen, what I'm looking for here is making sure that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the, the goals that I have possibly on my farm. And so what I would look at are some of these following characteristics. First of all, I am going to be looking at uh, what the breed should be producing. Uh, let's just take Holsteins. Now, all the other breeds are listed in the, the webinar, but Holsteins, you would expect to see uh, milk fat around 3.89. That's gone up in the last year or two because of the value of a fat. 
and a protein, this is true protein now, 3.09. And if you calculate the ratio, if you divide the fat into the protein, that's about 79, 80%. Conversely, you could all divide the protein into the fat, and that comes out about 1.25% uh, as far as that goes. So certainly we've got those kinds of uh, opportunities out there as well. Then we take a look at uh, the other aspect, and that is looking at uh, un unusual ratios or, or changes here. And again, we can take a look at uh, if your bulk tank, and I'm just looking at bulk tank, if that is at uh, that ratio is over 0.9, that basically says we're missing fat. So, so, so some, something's going on in your herd that we aren't getting the true fat. An example of that would be, Jen, is if we had like a 3-2 butter fat test and a 2-9 protein. That would get you pretty close to 0 0.9. So you're, you're, you're missing. Well, with a 2-9 protein, you should be sitting at about 3-5, 3-6. Now, if you they do the reciprocal, and if that ratio is under 0 0.75 or 75%, now you're missing protein, and that's going to cost you some money. And a good example would, let's say you've got a 4 butter fat test, and again, that same 2.9% protein, and now you're missing some, some protein there. So certainly that becomes a big factor as well. Then we look at milk fat inversions, and, uh, and that's another tool that we can look at as well. I know we're coming off the hot summer months, but September can also still have some hot days and cause heat stress on our cows. How does heat stress impact not only the health of the cow, but our milk components? Well, Fred, it's really interesting if we take a hard look at that, and, and farmers should be monitoring that. Uh, generally speaking, if you look even nationally across the United States, we expect in the summer heat uh, months, a milk component on fat goes down typically about two-tenths to three-tenths of a point. Milk protein can drop a tenth or two-tenths of a point. And of course, with our major markets here in the U.S., we are losing some real dollars as far as that goes. So certainly two take-home messages for our listeners. Number one, certainly be looking at somehow to reduce heat stress on cows. And of course, we can look at shade, fans, misters, those kinds of events as well. And then of course, uh, the, the other one is uh, how do we maintain intake and dry matter intake on these cows? And usually what's happening under the heat stress here, these cows are reluctant to eat as much dry matter because they know. They actually know that it will generate more heat. So again, anyway, we can reduce heat load on cows through r r adjusting the rash, such things as more digestible fiber, uh, using fats as an energy source here, getting the right uh, protein balance out there in the feeding programs, and getting a decan, a dietary cation, up to plus 350. And that also appears to help electrolyte balances as well. So certainly heat stress can have a major effect. Be watching for that because it's going to rob your pocketbook. And Mike, definitely getting those fresh cows off to a good start is, you know, really critical in that lactation. And last week on the webinar, we, can't, we had some discussion on fresh cows and where they should be in terms of fat and protein early on, you know, as they come into their lactation. Kind of mentioned some numbers that raise a red flag, but not only in Holsteins, what, what might be a general rule of thumb for kind of all breeds? Well, certainly uh, what I would do is, is take a look at, if, if you're on DHI records, we can get an early lactation profile on these cows. And so if you are seeing abnormally low milk protein, and that's been the big problem. We looked at some uh, 6,000 herds that come through the uh, North Carolina Processing Center, and that can, it takes them, uh, most of the herds here in the in Midwest part of the United States. Certainly we saw that milk protein in the first 100 days well below the 3%. Uh, true protein number. So certainly take a look and see if there is, uh, if, that's, if that's happening as well. Uh, another one, of course, would be to take a look at milk fat. And with the good news there is that uh, we look at it not only by lactation number and uh, by uh, uh, level of production, but we also saw that the high producing herds were achieving that. They were meeting a breed averages on, on milk fat, both on the Holstein and on the Jersey side of the equation. So certainly the question there is, why do those proteins really lag in early lactation, and especially younger cows? And I think it's driven by dry matter intake, also with the competition, availability of feeds, and maybe some overcrowding that occur as well. And in fact, Jen, one thing we would be looking at here is that if the butter fat is way high, that's another management concern, is that's another red flag. So if you start seeing butter fats like in the first month of Holstein's over 4.5, 
and the protein stays at a typical 3.1, oh, that, that's a big spread as far as that goes. So certainly those are things to look at. And in fact, one thumb rule we use is that uh, and it's kind of a, a, a thumb rule, not a lot of research, and that would be that if the if cows, we look at individual cows on DHI, if they are 0.5 to 0.7 above the herd average, boy, that should raise a red flag that those cows are probably mobilizing a lot of body fat. And of course, the mammary gland says, wow, that, that's a precursor for milk fat. We're going to make milk fat out of it. And then conversely, you can also look for inversions, which means now we see cows on DHI tests in which the, the butter fat test is below milk protein, and that's bad news. So those are all really red flags that if you look at individual cows, you can see what's going on. Bulk hay can really hide a lot, a lot of those changes. I like that idea of thinking about what your own herd average is and then using that 0.5 to 0.7 ratio as an indication because it really depends on the herd and their management. As we conclude here today, what are some of those take-home messages that we should leave our audience with? Well, Fred, as we wrap up today's podcast, certainly uh, uh, one take-home message is you need to take and be, evaluate your current milk fat and protein levels in your herd. Uh, time to dig in, uh, sit down with a glass of milk and determine uh, where, where you are at at this point. Number two, then say, well, gee, if my Holstein cows are producing 3.7, uh, or my uh, Jersey cows are at 4.4 um, uh, or 4.4 fat test. Uh, determine if there's some economic opportunities to increase that, those components, and that's going to be important. And then finally, consider some of the ways that you might be able. We talked about here briefly in more detail in the, the webinar is uh, how what are those sources? How can I get those there? And look at such things as nutrition management and breeding programs to get that job done. Mike. Thanks for all the great information here today. And as we conclude, I want to note that the webinar we had last week with your presentation can be found on our extension team website. And Jen will include the link with this recorded podcast for future reading and interpretation. Oh, and by the way, thank you very much for the opportunity invitation to do both the webinar and the podcast here today. Uh, I mean, I think there's some really exciting opportunities in the dairy industry to, uh, to the bill that now check. Thanks. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thanks to our listeners for joining us today and look forward to visiting with you on the next Dairy News and Views from Iowa State University. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statements or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu backslash diversity backslash ext.